throughout the past 24 hours or so. And another one spreading north tonight will bring some wet weather across southern England, south Wales, and that will develop some snow, perhaps over the West Midlands, certainly parts of Gloucestershire, Herefordshire, and into uh, central and then northern parts of Wales. Mostly over the hills, the snow, but there could be some at lower levels. Heavy rain for many elsewhere. As the rain clears from Scotland and Northern Ireland, some pockets of frost certainly likely here. And then we look at the winds picking up along the south coast. A very blustery day to come tomorrow. Met Office yellow warning in place for the winds here. And for the rain in Northern Ireland, cause some problems today with more rain and hill snow here tomorrow. Again, that could cause further disruption. Nowhere immune from the downpours, though, during Thursday. And uh, for most of us, going to feel pretty chilly as well. Temperatures while well, struggling to get to double digits and feeling colder with the wind and the rain. As we go through the long weekend, signs of the weather getting at least a little drier. Better chance of seeing some sunshine on Good Friday, particularly over northern England and eastern England in the morning. Showers will develop almost everywhere by the afternoon. Fewer showers on Saturday and Easter day at this stage looking largely dry and sunny of things at least turning just a little warmer. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello there, it's 6 o'clock and I'm Michelle Dubry. Coming up tonight, two British nationals are currently fighting in Ukraine. But for Russia, a former British Army boss says that they should be arrested and tried as traitors. Do you agree with that? Also today, a survey shows the lowest satisfaction levels in the NHS since records began. Are you satisfied with how it's all going or not? And if not, how on earth do we fix it all? And get this, the allowance is set to rise for the House of Lords to a whopping £360 per day. I'm in the wrong job. But in addition, they'll also be able to claim £100 a night to stay over in London too. Do you support that or not? And over in Oxford, they want to start charging bigger cars more money to park. Good idea or just plain old simple politics of envy? You tell me. Indeed, I've got all that coming up and more. I want to get stuck into as well that story. Have you seen yet another social services review saying uh, that the child services failed yet another child? What on earth goes on in this society? We'll have it all and more. But before we do, let's cross live for tonight's latest news headlines. Michelle, thank you, and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight is that a poll has found that fewer than one in four people in Britain are satisfied with the National Health Service. It's at its lowest level since records began, in fact, 40 years ago. With lack of access to GPs among the chief concerns, long waiting times are also a major worry. 24% of patients who were surveyed said they are satisfied with the health service. That's down from 70% in 2010. The report found that tight funding and staff shortages over the last decade has left the NHS in a continual state of crisis. Well, the Education Secretary today said that the government is working to improve standards. 
NHS has had um, you know, to deal with the pandemic and we all know that that has created huge backlogs and huge waiting lists and we're all committed to catch up to provide a faster, simpler, fairer NHS. We're investing £165 billion a year. Obviously, if you're investing that much, you want to have people satisfied with the service they're getting. But we do know that we've been tattling. I mean, th think for the last four months, the waiting lists have started to come down, but we're tattling a huge backlog. What's interesting is actually England, the Conservative-run England, the, the performance and the catch-up is much better than in Labour-run Wales or in SNP-run Scotland. Gillian Keegan. Now, Labour says it'll ban the bosses of water companies who oversee the pollution of Britain's waterways from receiving bonuses. Its after new figures show sewage was dumped into waterways for more than 3.6 million hours in 2023. That's more than double the previous year and the highest level on record. The leader of the Liberal Democrats, Ed Davey, says he's been warning the Conservatives about what he calls a sewage scandal for years. Liberal Democrats have been warning the Conservatives about this sewage scandal for years, that the fact that it's polluting our rivers, our beaches, and pushing ecosystems to the brink of collapse. But Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives just haven't listened. They've done far too little. That's why we need uh, a national environmental emergency to be declared and the sage health experts to come to make sure that we are uh, protecting human health, which is in danger because of this. Ed Davey. Now, a teacher who lost his job for what he said was his refusal to use a student's preferred pronoun has had his unfair dismissal claim rejected. Kevin Lister taught maths for 18 years at New College Swindon before he was sacked for gross misconduct. In the lead-up to the hearing, he said it was not the role of a teacher to confirm the gender transition of a student. But Carol Kitching, who was the school's principal at the time, said he wasn't dismissed for his beliefs, but rather for the way he harassed and treated the student. The UK and the United States have imposed joint sanctions on the fundraising network linked to the terror group Hamas. The measures target Amza Sultana and Mustafa Ayash, who are suspected of supporting Gaza Now. That's a media network accused of promoting the terror group. It marks the fourth coordinated move to sanction Hamas fundraisers since the attacks in Israel of October the 7th. Now, the children's service involved in the case of a murdered 10-month-old baby boy just weeks after he was handed back to his parents say they are profoundly sorry they were unable to prevent his death. Finlay Bowden's parents, Shannon Marsden and Stephen Bowden, inflicted over 100 injuries on their son before he died at the family home in Derbyshire on Christmas Day 2020. They were given life sentences in May comes after a safeguarding review found that while Finlay's parents were responsible for his death, professional interventions by the local authority should have protected him. To news from the United States now, and in particular the state of Maryland, where audios emerge detailing the moment that emergency workers tried to evacuate the bridge in Baltimore shortly before it collapsed. Take a listen. Uh, there's a ship approaching that just lost their steering. So they tell you get that under control, we got to stop all traffic. C-13 dispatch, the whole bridge just fell down. Start, start, whoever, everybody, the whole bridge just collapsed. The whole bridge just collapsed, says that audio. It comes after the search for survivors was suspended. Six construction workers are presumed dead. Video footage captured the moment the ship crashed into the bridge yesterday morning. The city's port is one of the busiest in the eastern United States and is now closed indefinitely. A driver who led police on a reckless high-speed chase reaching speeds of more than 140 miles an hour has been jailed. Munib Mehran was caught speeding on the M4 when officers asked him to pull over. Instead, as dash cam footage shows, he sped up. The 23-year-old admitted charges, including dangerous driving and possession of cannabis. Wiltshire Police says it's fortunate nobody was injured. He's been sentenced to 26 months in prison and disqualified from driving for 18 months. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on the screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts.
Thanks very much for that, Polly. I am Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company until 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, my panel, the former MEP and Conservative peer in the House of Lords, Jacqueline Foster, and the co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani. Good evening to both of you. And you know the drill, don't you, on this programme? It's about you guys at home as well. What's on your mind tonight? It's I've got a packed show coming up to you, for you. I want to talk about potential traitors uh, going over to fight for Russia. I want to talk about parking. Should bigger cars like your SUV you reach four by fours, whatever. Should they have to pay more to park? Also, the NHS, are you happy with it uh, at the moment or not? That and lots more coming your way. You can get in touch with me all the usual ways. GBviews at gbnews.com is how you email me or you can tweet or X me at gbnews. But for now, ladies and gents, I confess, I start my program tonight very angry indeed. In fact, actually, I'm furious. Well, why? Because, of course, we've had yet another safeguarding review published today, which focused on the murder of yet another young child. This time, it was 10-month-old Finlay Burden. His killers, of course, were his parents. And whilst I was angry enough at that, I was tipped over the edge when the report found that, yet again, this child was another one that was failed by the services that were supposed to protect him. I tell you now, this is a bit distressing to hear, I warn you in advance, because Finlay died with 130 injuries, and among those, he had fractures to his collarbones and his thighs. His pelvis was smashed in two places, likely from being stamped on. His injuries were st similar to that seen in multi-storey falls. He had burns on his hand, one from a hot, flat surface, another likely from a cigarette lighter flame. And this little boy, originally taken from his parents, was almost instantly returned to them. And whilst with his parents, social workers missed multiple visits. They didn't follow up on issues, they didn't follow up properly with health workers, and they didn't even intervene when they saw his mum likely buying drugs. The report today concluded that baby Finlay should have been one of the most protected children in the local authority area. Instead, he became like a lamb to the slaughter. And I wonder how many more times are we going to hear that lessons need to be learned, that changes need to be made, that people are sorry and so on and so forth. How many children are going to be failed before that actually happens? And to the children's services, I say this, we should have a change in the law now which sees those responsible for caring for these children be held criminally responsible if a child is murdered on their watch and if it becomes evident that duties were neglected. And to those parents, I simply say this, I hope whilst in prison, you get everything you deserve. Jacqueline, I've got goosebumps, right? I've lost count now of the amount of children that I've covered on this... I mean, we've only been broadcasting for a couple of years, there or thereabouts. The amount of children now that we've seen that have been tortured and killed by their parents, and all the time it feels like you hear this sentence in, we're sorry, uh, you know, we made mistakes, lessons will be learned. It's nonsense, lessons are never learned. Why? I've no idea, and I think what uh, I think is most frustrating is the naivety by... I think probably a lot of social workers do try and do a very good job. Um, but nevertheless, this is happening all the time. I think the point raised lessons learned. They never seem to learn lessons. They also, these people, um, like this couple in particular, uh, these are manipulative, deceitful people. They run rings round uh, the social workers. I think what added to um, this case, possibly, along with quite a few that we've had over the last year, it was during lockdown and during COVID. Mm. And we saw a lot of tiny or small children <clears throat> and some infants and others that may have gone to, say, a kindergarten or a nursery uh, fell through the net. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there were reasons that, well, we couldn't go because there weren't enough staff around. I think in this case, one of the social workers that was responsible was off for six weeks, but somebody didn't actually Yeah, she was off six, for six weeks and no one so, got involved, um, no one picked up I, that I case. I just find, like you, I am horrified with it, and I do hope that they get what they deserve, frankly. Indeed. Um, Aaron? Yeah, so... It's really important to uh, observe that the local authority here, the local authority will have social workers, the local authority will have a child protection lawyer. They said that there should be a gradual return to the parents of the child. So give them their, their due to that extent. The child also has access to a legal guardian. Now, historically, a guardian would have been a former social worker. They seem to be getting younger and younger these days. Mm. The guardian made a judgment which, in the end, was actually very tragic and clearly the wrong judgment. Yeah, for a swift return back to the parents. Quite. Whereas, whereas the local authority was saying, let's do this over several months. So if that decision had not been made and the magistrate sided with the Guardian, 
then that child would have been safe. Or this certainly wouldn't well, not happen. necessarily, because when you look into this, multiple visits were missed. There was loads of deceiving going on. There was pretending that this kid, oh, yeah, has got COVID, no, uh, is upstairs. Uh, uh, they didn't perceive, they didn't push, they didn't follow up on issues. Well, no, but what I want to say is, Michelle, they weren't saying that the, the child should be returned to the parent immediately. That's what the local authority's position was. There's also a guardian who's meant to look out for the best interests of the child, mm. which can often include going back to the parent, right? And the magistrate sided with the guardian. Now, what I would say is... You're saying that they should be legally liable. Yeah. I think already, I think already being a social worker or being a local authority child protection lawyer is a horrible job. Your work's the bone. You don't earn much money, so that means two things. Firstly, you don't re you don't really recruit the top best people. So it's a horrible job. And if you do, they get knackered, they get burnt out, and either they leave the industry or they are just. Their head goes. Yeah, but the stakes, so are, the stakes are too high, I'm afraid. So People can't say, oh, I was bad now, and then the outcome is a 10 year old, get, sorry, 10 month old getting tortured. I entirely agree with you. In yeah, child but we're having the same conversation every time this happens. Well, hold it's on. gone on for years. And you can't no, say that. Please, please my finish. No, I didn't yeah, interrupt you, please. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, child, but... child protection is one of those things where I think it has to have more money. It has to have it's more money. It's not just about money. If you talk to, it's not just, just about, about money, but that's a big part of it. You talk to any local authority child protection lawyer, you talk to any social worker, they will tell you the job was easier 25 years ago for a bunch of reasons, but they are more harshly worked today than they were 25 years ago. So the idea that we don't give them more resources or we don't make that job more, um, you know, just solvable, I, I think is a fool's errand. We can blame them. I want to sort the problem out. I think it needs more resources, better people, better recruitment, more money paid to people doing the job. Honestly, um, I wish that this was the last time we had to have this conversation. I'd give anything, actually, for it to be the last time we had the conversation because things move on and changes get made. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think it will be. I worry that there will be more children. Um, and I say this as well. If you're a parent, you don't need to abuse your child. There's so many people desperate to adopt so uh, children. Just let... If you can't love them, Give them to someone else that will love them and give them a decent life. Look, give me your thoughts. GB Views at gbnews.com. Oh, honestly, I don't know. Let's move on because there are lots more uh, stories that I need to talk to you about tonight. Two British men um, have been revealed. This was um, an expose in the Mirror newspaper, actually. They're over in Russia. Um, sorry, they're fighting for Russia in their war against Ukraine. Now, one of the former army bosses, uh, Colonel Richard Kemp, he's basically said these guys are essentially traitors. Um, they should be uh, tried, uh, probably jailed uh, to that end. Where are you on that, Jacqueline? I think one of them had already been in jail for a few years. Um, I think he's absolutely correct. Um, they are traitors. Um, what they are doing is they are fighting with uh, regimes and countries. In this case, uh, obviously, it's Russia, uh, where the relationship isn't great at this moment in time as they've invaded an ally. And uh, therefore, they are on the wrong side of the law. Um, we found him on it. You did a very good briefing here because there is the, the, the law is from the Foreign Enlistment Act 1870, uh, which says it makes it illegal to join armed forces of a country fighting a state of peace with Britain. So uh, they have broken the law. And um, it's not the first time we get these people. They're like mercenaries, really. They're not all ex-armed forces. Some, some are, and then some uh, just go out there to, to join whatever group. And um, I think if he comes back, I think he should end up in jail again. And uh, it is treason, and there isn't, you know, anything other than that to say. I mean, Putin, Aaron, actually, uh... Putin actually blamed the UK the other day, for being party to the terrible terrorist attack. Yeah, I saw that. Which, which killed all of those young people at the music festival that they have recently had, which actually was proven to be um, uh, the group, terrorist group called ISIS-K. Mm. But he said Britain was involved in that. I mean, this is actually what we're up against, and the people of Ukraine are up against, frankly. Uh, Aaron? Should they be arrested? Well, of course they should be arrested. They've broken the law. The question is which laws would apply, and as, um, as Jacqueline just said a moment ago, it's really interesting that um, here they will probably be uh, charged under anti-terror legislation. Yeah. But actually, I think it makes more sense to use the, the legislation from 1870, the Foreign Enlistment Act, which was just described a moment ago. And it's a classic example for me of there is a piece of legislation on the books from literally 150 years ago which covers this perfectly... Why on earth do you need to use legislation from 15 years ago? And Tony Blair, I have no idea. Um, so anti-terror legislation, I don't think that quite covers it. 
These are people who are fighting alongside the armed forces of a hostile state. It's a state entity. It's not a non-state entity, which is generally how we think of terrorism. So absolutely should be arrested. And also, I don't know how on earth this gentleman, after being in prison for fighting in Russia, gets a visa to go back to Russia. One of the things that struck me... Um, obviously, I don't think this justifies anything, but it just uh, kind of struck me a little bit. He said, uh, one of these guys said, I'm a working-class man, but with no work. He was really struggling, he was saying, to find his purpose and all the rest of it here in this country. What do you think to that? Well, I was out of work once, and I know loads of people who've been out of never... work many times, and I don't think we sort of thought, hmm, you know, what do you think we should do? Let's go and get a visa and pop over to Russia or pop over and join, you know, ISIS or Hamas or whoever. Um, no, the vast majority of people don't even think that way. So to sort of use that as some sort of reason or excuse or whatever is complete nonsense. He's decided what he wants to do. He's already done this before and he's gone back. Do you so. think it's nonsense? Because I wonder, is there something in this where, like, if you are, um, like he said, I'm a working-class guy, he's lost his way, and then you get caught into... People spend too much time on the internet, they start reading stuff, you get sucked into stuff, you've got too much time on your hands, and then before you know it, you're getting radicalised. Any, mm. any sympathy with that, Aaron? Uh, uh, sometimes it's true, but this gentleman is 48 years old. You know? yeah. If we were talking about a 21-year-old person who'd been radicalised as a teenager, thrill-seeker, going abroad, I would be not sympathetic to him, certainly sympathetic to the argument. He's 48. It was quite funny. They... they this article from the Mirror, they speak to his father, who's now estranged, and I was expecting them to say the father was in his 50s. He's 76. I've, I've, this poor man, he's got a tearaway son, causing him problems and heartache at the age of 48. That should not he's, be happening. The dad is 76, he's a folk singer, yeah. a Morris dancer, <laughs> uh, and a former town councillor um, in Great, from Greater Manchester, apparently. He says he's cut his son off. I don't know why, but the, the two different worlds. You've got one fella that's busy uh, Morris dancing away, <laughs> and then his offspring can be this kind of wrong one. Um, as I said, his dad has disowned him. Uh, we shall follow that story with interest and see what, if anything, happens next. But what are your thoughts on it, GB Views, at GB News? Com. After the break, I want to talk to you about the NHS. Lowest levels of satisfaction now since records began. My inbox has already started filling up with stories from you guys, uh, giving me good positive experiences. So tell me, uh, are you happy with the NHS or not? If not, why not? See you in two. This is GB News. Britain's News Channel. Can the Church of England not spend their money as they wish? The Church of England can do amazing things for this country and for the world. And I'm not sure why it's chosen to focus on this specific issue. You know, one of the causes that I've always thought the church was very good at were things called almshouses, which were basically houses that would be built on church estates for the needy. Not only did they want to spend £100 million on this fund, that they wanted to spend £1 billion on reparations as well. Well, why not spend... 100 million or a billion pounds on a new generation of almshouses as opposed to just helping one group of people, black British people, why not just help all people in need? Alex? Well, I, I just don't understand what the Church of England is trying to do. It's on its deathbed. Congregations have, have reduced. Reduced. I mean, deathbed is maybe a I mean, bit... well, <laughs> if we look over 20 years, it's dramatically lower than it used to be. And, and, and a lot of criticism from actual Christians come from the, the values that the Church of England are now propagating. And Justin Welby has a lot to answer for because, you know, not only are we seeing in the news this mass conversion of illegal immigrants to a gay mass system in the UK, but now we're seeing them spending money... And, and and as Albie actually points out correctly, it, it, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't really benefit broader society, it benefits a very small group of people. So I, I just don't know where it's going to end. This committee has also said one million is not enough. It's 100 million, sorry. Um, it's, the, the church commissioners are now hoping to, for a target of one billion. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, a... it's work nonsense, isn't it? You could make the argument that this is charity. Austin Welby's job is to be a virtue, should, virtue signaler, well, is it not? Should charity discriminate? I mean, that's what he's saying. We're only going to give this to people from a specific skin colour or background. I don't think that's it, it very Christian of them. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels 
we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Jubin. I'm with you until 7 o'clock tonight alongside me. My panel remain. I've got the former MEP and the Conservative peer in the House of Lords, Jacqueline Foster, and the co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani. We were just talking about social workers and children's services before the break. Graham uh, says, sorry, Ron says that one of the problems with social workers, etc., these days is such a high turnover of staff. Mm. How can you have any continuity? Uh, he says it's not simply about money. It surely is about that continuity more than anything at all. I think you've got a good point there. Um, I shall come on to the NHS next because a uh, big survey published out today shows that less than a quarter of us apparently are happy with the NHS. The worst satisfaction rates now since records began. Lots of you have been getting in touch. Uh, Jack says, Michelle, I had two heart attacks last year. The ambulance arrived within 15 minutes. I was straight into treatment. He says, Blackpool, Victoria is fantastic. He says, thank you to all of you for saving my life. And I've got to say, I've got quite a few positive stories about the NHS coming in. Are you satisfied with the way it's going, Jacqueline, at the moment, or not? No, I'm not satisfied with the way it's going. <coughs> but I would agree with the uh, caller or the, you know, the email. Um, I have friends who are actually surgeons who are frontline in mm. the NHS and, and others I, I know who, who are nurses. Um, and I don't think the criticism is predominantly with... A lot of people at work in the NHS, particularly frontline, I think mm. we have some of the best in the world and they are magnificent. The structure has become more and more of a problem, I think, over the last years. And it can't keep up, it can't keep up really, with the demand. Um, so I think that uh, the bureaucracy, what they say to me is that the bureaucracy that they deal with now when they're just trying to do their normal jobs has sort of escalated beyond whatever, in terms of then the amount of paperwork they're filling in, the amount of emails they're having to check, the amount of people then running a department which, you know, has a manager with a manager. And there are about, I think, three quarters of a, three quarters of a million, if you'd say managers, administrators in, in the NHS, there's about 1.4 million people work there. And um, also there's an issue, I think, with the calibre of some of those, certainly uh, managerial, uh, the calibre um, working on the operational side who don't seem to be up to the job. You can, by all means, you can criticise governments and, and we always have to take that criticism. But by the, same, by the same token, the NHS themselves, the trust themselves, we're paying uh, chief execs a lot of money to run these hospitals. Uh, some of them are appalling, some of them are, are very good. Um, and they just vary throughout the country. And I think one of the main issues is getting past the GP. Once you are in there, the treatment can be absolutely excellent. Uh, but I think we've got a massive problem uh, with the whole of the front line in terms of GP practices. Let's have a look at some of these key targets as well. I can just bring that up on the screen just to give you some um, examples of what's going well and what's perhaps not. Um, I mean, get your magnifying glasses out, mm. ladies and gents. Um, in England, uh, the last time the four-hour A&E wait um, was hit was July 2015. Um, in Northern Ireland, that's never been reached. In Scotland, that was last um, met in July 2020. In Wales, it's never been reached, that four-hour A&E target. Uh, we're giving you some cancer, 62-day uh, cancer targets there. Again, they don't look great. Um, and so on it goes. Uh, Bronwyn says, Michelle, can I say, I've moved up to the Doncaster area and I can't fault the service I've had from the NHS, uh, particularly the GP service uh, I'm signed up for, she says. I think the overall problem with NHS is poor management and waste. Uh, they seem to get away with everything because it's too easy to blame the government, she says. Aaron, where are you? I think 
Part of the answer is it's very patchy and people are more likely to remember and recall and bring up a, a bad experience rather than a good one. You can have mm -hmm. four great experiences. If you have one very bad one, that's what's going to stick in your mind. I agree with many of the points made around, around management. I think it's a problem actually in the public sector too often that we have the worst of the private sector, we have the worst of the public sector. I see it in local government all the time in stories with local authorities. Uh, you know, somebody will be the head of regeneration in a certain council and you look at, the, look at the place and think, well, it needs some regenerating. Why is that person 150 grand a year? What are they being judged on? Have they still got a job? So I agree with a lot of that. What I would say is what's really interesting with the NHS is that after 2010, through to about 2018-19, you could make, a, and you, you disagree with this, I'm sure, you could make an argument that, you know, there'd been cuts in austerity, but the service was still pretty pretty good, but, you know, on various um, measures, it had gone, it'd gone down. What's fascinating is that since COVID, actually, a ton of money has been spent on the NHS, a ton. Mm -hmm. I say this to somebody on the left. Mm -hmm. And actually, the outcomes are getting worse, not better. It's but a, why do you think that is, then? Well, that's the $64 million question. It's a, it's a really interesting... I mean, if it, if it weren't literal lives at stake, it would be interesting. But it's a really sophisticated, difficult problem. The government is spending the money, but it's not leading to better outcomes right now. Which, which I found interesting because, right, people were asked, would you want to pay more money for the NHS? And I found it quite interesting, the amount of people that said they would be willing to spend more, so actually be taxed more, if it meant direct spending more on the NHS. Well, I wouldn't want to spend a penny more on the NHS until I was clear that the efficiencies uh, were kind of optimised, that you were as running as best as you possibly could, that you don't have wastage, that your outcomes are the best they can be. Only then, when I knew that was right and already, would I spend any more in tax given the choice on the NHS? Well, you shouldn't have to spend any more on the NHS. We are spending hundreds of billions on the NHS, and you made a good point. Uh, a bucket full of money was put in. Um, but... What you did mention was key, I think, and as I'd mentioned a bit earlier, talking about the GPs, mm. that the access to your GP before COVID was much easier. Mm. Mm. And during COVID, of course, that stopped. And in some practices, it stopped. It was stopped by... People couldn't even virtually get a phone call. And unfortunately, that's still going on. Now, if you cannot get an appointment, it's all very well saying, well, you can have a word with the receptionist or you can have a word with whatever. It's not the same thing. Mm. Doctors train for years because they're looking for certain things. And it doesn't mean to say if we go and see a nurse practitioner because we're having a jab. That's perfectly fine. But there are only certain levels of, uh, of things that they are going to diagnose. And I think until the front line in terms of GP practices are sorted out and they're not left short of money. Mm. They have plenty of funding, quite frankly. Um, there are some that are very good, but there are too many and I know people and they're having a horrendous time trying mm. to see a doctor and they genuinely do need to see the doctor. Mm. Um, I think what we're trying to do, which is quite good, is look at how pharmacists can come in on all of it's this. Great policy, yeah. Pharmacists, I think this is a great policy. Um, we have great pharmacists. They're highly trained in this country. They know more about drugs than most of the doctors put together. Mm. And they will always refer you back to your doctor if they think that there is something that's looking not great. But a pharmacist can quite often uh, come up with a solution to save that time for you going to a doctor or even going to A&E. Yeah. I don't want to be too controversial, so I'm going to pick my words carefully. But do you think Oof. that we've got... I know I'm trying really hard. <laughs> I'm trying really hard. Um, you watch it come out all wrong. What I'm trying to get at is the NHS, to me, you're supposed to be there to try and save lives, prolong a good, healthy standard of living. Now, it seems to me that the NHS is being used for everything. Mm. And, again, I'm mm. trying to pick my words carefully. Whether it was trying to indulge children who think that they're an opposite sex whether it's trying to give same-sex couples IVF and so on and so forth. There are so many different things now that are not related to how do we, you know, stop somebody from dying, how do we give someone uh, a healthy uh, standard of living. We've kind of gone off on all these different tangents. So do you think IVF should be... Well, I don't know. For, for a I don't couple. know, and I sit there and I think, what is... Maybe we need to have some really harsh conversations about what is the NHS actually for? What is it? Is it for all of these kind of things, such as, um, you know, IVF treatments? Is it for, uh, in some cases, cosmetic things? In some cases, um, you know, helping children transition or whatever? Is it that? Is it for that? 
Well, the children's transition, transitioning point, people can agree or disagree, that is a tiny number of operations, but the IVF It's one, a direction of travel. Sure, I, it's, I, a, it's a scope of services. I mean, IVF is... whether a, or not it should be. IVF is a lot of money. Uh, that's, a, that's, an, that's an important point. And it's a fascinating question. You know, obviously... But should it be used for that? Well, what I would say is your question about we need to actually think fundamentally about the kinds of things we're looking to offer, I think, is absolutely the right one. Again, I'm coming at this from the left. I would like to increase capital gains tax. I'd probably like to reduce VAT. But broadly speaking, the NHS, like you said, is about £140 billion. Pounds. It's a lot of money. Mm. It's a lot of money. And it should be getting better outcomes. And I think we probably do need a conversation in this country. We were talking about child protection a moment ago. I think it should have more money. That's not necessary to give the social workers more pay. We need more social workers. We need more people because they're overstretched. That's the sort of thing which needs more resources. Um, there are other things which need more resources, but then we're going to have to have difficult conversations about... So let's okay, try and have a very okay, difficult conversation. What, what should the, state not should do? the NHS be there for IVF? Let's can, pick that as a strand. Yeah, can, can, can I just... Uh, no, I want him to answer it. What, what's your thoughts? I, I, I don't... I, I would have to see the numbers. Mm -hmm. I'd have to see the numbers. I don't know. But what also, do we've think? got low birth rates. I mean, that's a counter That is there. true. That is very true. What well, do you think? Well, I, I think um, there are people who will have a medical issue and would like to have a family. Mm. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. And I think you're talking relatively small numbers in the scheme of things. And therefore, I would expect the NHS, I mean, if they can go private, fine. A lot of people do go private, mm. actually, mm. for IVF treatment. Um, but um, if they are, they can be helped to get pregnant and, and have a baby, um, I'm quite OK with that. Because I think if we start to focus just on some smaller groups, we no, lose maybe where I, we are. Maybe, I, maybe because I was trying to be um, no, I think diplomatic with my yeah. wedding, it might not have come across. What I'm saying is... Maybe if people have already got maybe one or two children and then they want to get another child and then they need IVF, maybe you should pay for it themselves. If you yeah, see what I've I just, mean. I've maybe picked on two kind yeah, of specialist quite niche things. things. Yeah. But I guess the, the central point of what I'm saying is, yeah. do we need to go right back to basics, look at the NHS and go, right, what is the purpose of the NHS? What is it actually well, for? The, the is it for any ailment, for any... So, like, for example, mm -hmm. if you are someone who insists on taking drugs and then you get support with your uh, detox and all the rest of it, yeah. and then off you go back again and you take drugs and back through detox you go and around and around and around, should there be cut-offs? I mean, well, I just... They're, maybe they're, I'm going too niche in no, my questioning. No, no, because they're clogging up A&E and you'll get people who are drunk. And, I mean, not drunk occasionally but they're picking them up because they're drunk and they're in A&E because that's, the, that's where they have to take them at times. But the, the key problem with the NHS, it was set up for the, really the right reasons. It really was. Um, but a serv health service should be, should be proactive and not reactive. And the problem with the NHS, everything is reactive. It should be focusing more like they do in continental Europe. And there aren't NHSs in continental Europe. lived in four countries. And they're all insurance-based, or there is a very small part of the pie if people don't earn anything. But it's, uh, it, it's funded privately. They're funded mm -hmm. privately. People don't wait more than 24 hours for a GP appointment. Um, the service that they get is very good. And that's across the piece. And that's, that's generally with that sort of model that they use. I'd like, I think that we're going to have to, with the size of the population and the demands, we're going to have to start thinking seriously cross-party, cross-party, having proper conversations, which we never ever, ever do with the NHS, of seeing how we can actually restructure this service uh, so it can actually do the job that we'd like it to do. The challenge that you've got, though, is it's almost like the NHS is like some kind of... Religion. It needs to stop. And we've got to almost, yeah. people almost worship it. And if you even try, and this is why I don't know if there's any politicians that have got the chops, really, because you need, I think, to have really difficult conversations where you go back to basics and you literally sit there and go, look, what, we, what we've got isn't working. I think everyone can see that. So it's not working. But, so what does the future look like? But it's one of the few things which the taxpayer gets. It goes, I'm paying my taxes, I get this. You know, schools for your kids, NHS, pensions. Yeah. And people pay a hell of a lot of tax. And if all of a sudden somebody says, actually, let's privatise this, they say, well, hold on no, a second. No, I wasn't, no, I wasn't no, no, suggesting I know you're privatisation. Not, no, no, I know you're not saying that, but it's, I, on the one hand, there is the whole religion of the NHS, that's true, but it's also one of the very few things which people think, well, my taxes are paying for that, and I can mm. see it and I engage with that and I use it, you know, every couple of years. Yes, but if but you can't more, access more it, what good people, is it? More and more people <clears> are, taking, <throat> uh, are taking out health insurance now. Sure. And more and more people now, they just <coughs> get into a point where they haven't got anything that's, that's going to kill them, but they've got debilitating issues and, and they can't get back to work. 
So they're actually actually I just want to give a the money few, to make appointments. I just want to give a few shout outs because yeah. I know that so many people on the front line work really hard. Darren yeah. says I've had a I had an op yesterday in Royal Hallamshire Hospital, Sheffield. He says it was all excellent and he wants to say a big thank you to all of the team that looked after him. Uh, one of my viewers here, she says she's got kidney problems, Sally, kidney patient for 25 years, and I've had fantastic care from Hull Royal and Castle Hill. A uh, big shout out to all of those guys. Lots and lots. It's actually quite heartwarming, actually, because mm. so many of you are getting in touch to share uh, your positive stories, which is really nice. Penny, though, says, I cannot get in to see a GP for love nor money. There you go. Let's talk the House of Lords after the break. Pay rise coming their way. Do they deserve it or not? You tell me. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right. We want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Jubri with you till Sarah and Aaron Bastani, Jacqueline Foster remain alongside me. Let's get straight into this Ooh. next one, the House of Lords. They are set to get quite a nice uh, little increase in their daily allowance, everyone. It's currently 342 quid. It's going up to 360 quid. This is, of course, lined up with a 5.5% increase in MP salaries. Also, as well, there's this an additional um, amount of money now. You can potentially get £100 a night if you need to stay over in London. Are you celebrating all these moves, Jacqueline? No, because I won't get a hundred pound a night. It's look the way the way the allowance is structured. It's you're quite right. It's three hundred and forty-two pounds. That currently is that tax free. Yes, it's an allowance. It's actually the same premise. When I was a member of the European Parliament, 
and we had a daily allowance because nobody, nobody lived in Brussels. Everybody came from a different country. What it does is it covers your accommodation because mm -hmm. not everybody lives in London. I come from the northwest. People come from Scotland and everywhere. It has to cover your accommodation. It also, in the House of Lords, we don't get a, um, an allowance for staff. So if we want to maybe get a researcher or we want to get some secretarial help, we'd have to use that to do that too. So it's like a subsistence allowance as well. You do not get this allowance if you do not turn up to the House of Lords and you are not in the chamber or you are not sitting on a, an, a, a, an official committee. So it's only if you are there that you get it. And I'm not being defensive about this. This is what they get. This additional £100 has come in for a lot of people who stay in hotels um, only, a commercial uh, places, residences, um, because the prices of hotels over the last couple of years have basically gone sky high. So do you high. think 360 then? Is it enough? Is it too little? No, I think 360 is fine. I think it's high. fair? Yeah. Aaron Bastani? Let me be a, a Conservative. Let's just get rid of three quarters of the Lords. Mm -hmm. and That's then a very I think, big chamber. No, but they're not costing us any money. Well, hold on. But I, look, here's the thing. In any organisation, the quickest route to failure is giving somebody a job and making it part-time because mm -hmm. they don't actually do the thing properly. So, look, if we want a second chamber, let's have a much smaller one, give them the resources, give them the office, staff, etc., etc. They shouldn't. They certainly should be out of pocket staying somewhere. It's ridiculous. So it's very... I don't know if I can say it before the watershed. half arsed that's how it feels. The half, whole half bottom. half bottom. the whole approach. So either, you know, you could have unicameralism, you could get rid of a second chamber, or you could just have a much smaller second chamber with the best lords in it. I, I kind of... I see both sides of the argument with this, uh, but I just think the lords, as it presently exists, is a very, very strange organisation, strange institution. I think we, we could have far fewer of them and, and probably give them a slightly better deal and get on with the job. So shrink you down? Jacqueline? Look, I don't mind. I mean, the, the good thing, the positive thing about this second chamber of ours is no, no party which is in government will have a majority. Uh, we don't have a majority. So what you do is get proper, proper, proper debate. Um, for example, for, for the government side in the House of Lords currently, this is why we're having problems getting the Rwanda bill through, and we had problems with the illegal immigration bill through. Um, if Labour and the Lib Dems combine... Then and then a few. We've got a hun and we've got 184 cross benches as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot get things through. Uh, when you end up with ping pong, obviously it goes back and forward to the House of Commons, and we end up everything ends up being dragged out because ultimately, quite rightly, the House of Commons is is the is the premium chamber. Uh, we cannot overrule them, quite rightly. Um, so it, it is a tricky one, and I know the sort of. 700 and something laws, um, an awful lot of them don't ever come. And I think where there are some positives out, depending on what structures people want in the future, they're not all politicians either. We were talking about IVF. On the opposition benches sits Lord Winston, and he was the one that invented IVF. So we've got great people in there who were uh, experts in medicine, law, the arts, business, not only politicians. Whilst I'm sure bring my viewers, quite a lot to the table. Whilst I'm sure my viewers anyway. like you, Jacqueline, um, oh. many of them are saying um, it, it basically uh, needs to be slimmed down, reformed. Richard says the House of Lords is a gravy train full of the indulgent privileged. He says. Yeah, um, Danielle says it's not fit for purpose. Um, John says we need an internal investigation into the whole thing. Um, and Jeff said, no, you should not get a pay rise. Wish I could earn three hundred pound plus a day to fall asleep. Oh, blimey, that will uh, that will upset a few people. I can tell you. Let's talk parking after the break in Oxford now. Proposals that if you drive a big like four by four SUV, you should have to pay more to park. Is that fair or not? This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, 
using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night. You're going to be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over scrub and over brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning, as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, Michelle Jubri with you till seven alongside my former MEP and Tory peer in the House of Lords, Jacqueline Foster and co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani. I was just asking Aaron uh, in the break if he was offered uh, a peerage, a place in the House of Lords, <laughs> would he take it? He said no. I'm not sure I believe him. Just for the record, anyone wants to nominate me, I would uh, be in there like a rat up a drain pipe. I, I don't <laughs> mind being called a hypocrite. I would absolutely love it. Your, you, your viewers, your viewers I'll nominate you. Oh, I'll I'm lording it all over. It'd be fabulous, <laughs> wouldn't it? Anyway, look, let's talk parking. Uh, the Green Party councillors in Oxford, they're proposing to charge bigger cars, so like your 4 by 4s your SUVs, uh, whatever, more money uh, if they want to park. This is all about, apparently, um, stopping congestion and all this and that. What do you make to it, Jacqueline? It's a cash cow. All of it's a cash cow. Whether it's in most areas, uh, they've put up 20 miles an hour and cameras everywhere, like London, where there are no people around at all. I mean, we're not talking about schools here. Um, and it's all basically, most of the time, it's about catching people out. Uh, in this case now, is it the politics of envy? whatever, uh, you know, and then they tried to put an argument to say if you were hit by a bigger car uh, rather than a smaller car, then there would be less damage, um, which is nonsense, frankly. And um, so I, I just don't know where they come from. I think apparently in Oxford as well, um, they've, put, they've put all sorts of um, restrictions on people accessing where they go or into the city centre, and people are driving miles around the city to even get in into the uh, city centre. So, no, I just think it's nonsense, frankly. So, Jacqueline's not having any of it. Aaron, are you? I think it's sensible. Um, I quite like the Kia Sportage 2024. It's a very nice SUV. <laughs> nice, nice green. Um, so, I've not got an issue with the cars, necessarily. Some people need them. You have a big family. You might have dogs, etc. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But the point is, they do take up more space. And I live in Portsmouth. And parking is at a premium in Portsmouth. And the reality is, if you're a household in Portsmouth, very... Small island, 350,000 people. Mm -hmm. If three people in that household all have SUVs, it's a genuine problem. Not everybody on the street can have an SUV. And so I think it's only fair, if you're going to make that decision, well, OK, pay a little bit more so that the council can pay for 
municipal car parks oh. or to have... Well, I, no, I, I, that's my view. <laughs> it's called in economics an externality. So a negative externality of having an SUV is that it's going to take up more parking space. If they hit somebody, it's more likely to lead to a fatality. And I think this should be down to the, lo the local authority. So Oxford is a historic city. Or well, Portsmouth, it's quite small. If you live in West Cumbria or the Peak District, have an SUV, you shouldn't be taxed for it, great. But I think if a local authority says, look, space is at a premium, actually, we want to charge you a bit for having that slightly bigger car, I think that seems reasonable. Oh, they'll be yeah. telling you how big your house is supposed to be next, and there's only three of you, so don't be living in a house. Oh, this is like... Nanny. Wasn't that the bedroom tax? This is... Oh, I remember, <laughs> remember it well. <laughs> um, no, this is a typical nanny-type stuff. I really can't stand it. it. It irritates me. And why don't they just leave people alone? Choose whatever car you want, what fits with your family, and if we're parking, we all pay the same for our parking. I um, think they've got anyway. a damn cheek, some of these councils, to sit there charging for this, charging for that, when the state of their... They don't even fill their own potholes, Quite. so many of these councils, and then they've got the audacity, motivated by jelousy, if you ask me, when people see these uh, four why by it, fours. Why is it jealousy? Because I think a lot of these green councillors... A lot of these green councillors and the rest of it, they sit there and I think they look at some of these... Um, let's just say... Let's just pick a Range Rover, a Range Rover, a big car. Great car. And I think people get get very jealous and then you get these pillocks that go out and slash the tires of these kind of cars I don't know who these guys think they are they call it well I won't even say what they call themselves the group because I don't want to promote the group but they go around slashing the tires of four by fours and then they leave a little sticker on the window saying you've been visited by whatever this group is I'm not going to promote them and they go on about the um, you know the environmental effects of these cars you've got these councils now crying um, saying oh if you want to come in here you've got to pay extra because your car's a little bit bigger, you don't take up much more than a parking space. No, you don't. In fact, I don't think you pay. You do. Any... I used to drive. You do, you I do. confess, I did. That maybe in your as road. So, as soon as I had my baby, the first thing I did is upgrade to a big car. Oh, totally. Because Families I had this tiny little thing, yep. my baby, and I thought I need to because I do a lot of motorway driving. I need a bigger car. Anyway, I got rid of this car because the insurance was absolutely insane. The larger car. Yeah. Mm. The well, that's insurance in London, companies, right? Yeah, the insurance companies were taking the absolute Michael what they wanted to charge. So gone, oh, got it. rid. I missed that car dramatically. Do you not have a drive in London? So I... If you have a drive, then it always uh, always helps with the old insurance. No, but most people live outside London, don't they? No, but, but it's I agree not with Michelle. Car I mean, I have to have a larger car. For lollipop. Mm. Lollipop the dog mm. needs an estate car. Mm. And, uh, you know, I would probably end up falling into this with my But you're both very successful car. people. My view is you both deserve nice cars, you've worked for your money, but the point is it's going to take up slightly more space, it's going to create more problems with the cars. My car's ten years old. It's ten years old. Charge. No, councils. No, no, no. For an SUV, not an estate. Do SUV your concerns. jobs, get your basics right, fix your roads, and when you actually offer a road that people can drive on without damaging Oxford's their got cars, nice roads. then you can start talking Oxford. about charging more. Good roads. Graham says, Michelle, there's too many of these ridiculously sized cars around. Of course they sh uh, should pay more. He says, I've got to say, though, he says, I drive a Bentley, so I'm shooting myself Legend. in the foot. He's all right. Um, yeah, uh, Kevin says, I drive a small 4 by 4 and I already pay additional tax for it, he says. Yeah, um, I'm doing my bit for the environment, but I'm being taxed even more for yeah. doing so. Many people as well talking about things like congestion charge when you've got to drive into the cities. Um, electric cars. In some cases, why are they um, having to pay some of these uh, fees? Because they don't even create any emissions like that, do they? Anyway, look, that's all we've got time for. Let me know your thoughts. I'll read them on the way home. But for now, Aaron, Jacqueline, thank, thank you, you and thank you at home. Don't go anywhere. Farage is up next. Night night. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. The weather continues to throw pretty much everything at us. Further heavy downpours tomorrow, snow in places and some gusty winds along the south coast. Thanks to this area of low pressure, bounds of showers have been spreading across the country throughout the past 24 hours or so. And another one spreading north tonight will bring some wet weather across southern England, south Wales. And that will develop some snow, perhaps over the West Midlands, certainly parts of Gloucestershire, Herefordshire and into uh, central and then northern parts of Wales. Mostly over the hills, the snow, but there could be some at lower levels. Heavy rain for many elsewhere. As the rain clears from Scotland and Northern Ireland, some pockets of frost certainly likely here. And then we look at the winds picking up along the south coast. A very blustery day to come tomorrow. Met Office yellow warning in place for the wind 